Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to this installment of the World Trade Center Utah webinar series. Today we're very excited to have Jonathan Bench with Harris Brickin and Dustin Daughtry with Denzen Shira to help us understand and think through how Southeast Asia can be an alternative to China for our Utah companies. Um, we apologize to everybody that registered last week. Uh, we experienced a pretty epic Zoom fail. I think as we all got on, we got that Zoom air message um, but we are grateful for Jonathan and Dustin for their flexibility and rescheduling for this week and for everybody to, to tuning in. We know that many people that registered are unable to make it this morning due to schedule conflicts. We will be recording this and we'll be emailing it out to everybody who registered. And so if you can't catch it live, you'll have an opportunity uh, at your leisure to, to, to view this webinar. And we also will we'll be sharing uh, some of the slides and other information that Dustin and Jonathan have pulled, have pulled together. Uh, my name is Miles Hansen. I'm the president and CEO of World Trade Center Utah. And before we jump into the topic at hand, I thought it'd be helpful to provide a bit of a big picture perspective uh, as we see it at World Trade Center Utah. For those that aren't familiar with us or, the, or what we do as an organization, um, every state in the country does trade promotion. And in almost every state, it is a state entity, a state office that helps do this trade promotion work, meaning it helps its companies increase its international sales, it helps uh, with supply chain optimization and sourcing and, and those types of things we'll be talking about today. And they also work to attract investment to, to that particular state. Utah is unique in that instead of having a state agency do it, uh, we have uh, the World Trade Center Utah uh, fills this function for the state and we provide that uh, international leadership uh, for Utah's business community. So we run a, a series of programs. Uh, Jim Porter, who is our trade service manager, will be speaking at the end of this webinar to go a little bit deeper about the, the, the free programs and resources that we have available to help your company grow and succeed internationally, whether or not you're looking for uh, opportunities to increase your revenue, uh, optimize your supply chain, or looking for investment. You know, at this point, uh, to state the obvious, COVID have, has changed just about everything. And that's an effect that every business tuning in today has felt, and it's something that here at World Trade Center Utah, we have felt as well. One aspect of these changes, and, and there's been a lot of talk and attention on the value in shorter supply chains. And so the state of Utah, the, the U.S. administration, uh, there is a concerted effort to take a look at what can we do to help interested companies uh, find sourcing or manufacturing here domestically. Uh, Utah is a great place to manufacture. It's a great place to source. And so you'll see us very much involved in this effort to help companies shorten the supply chain, simplify things. And so we can help uh, make sure that, that, that companies are able to produce and source close to markets and as close as possible to their markets. That said, of course, not everything should or could be manufactured or sourced here in Utah. The most important thing for our companies, the most important thing to help our companies to continue to compete and win internationally is to have highly efficient supply chains. Effective supply chains and supply chain efficiency gives businesses a critical competitive advantage that helps them grow uh, and succeed in the international marketplace. And so we want to make sure that we are focusing like a laser on helping companies uh, optimize their supply chains and find the most efficient places to both produce and source as part of their supply chains. And this webinar is gonna help us understand uh, what opportunities exist in Southeast Asia for companies and how companies can be thinking through the sourcing and manufacturing and the supply chain issues. And also Southeast Asia is growing tremendously, uh, becoming an economic powerhouse uh, throughout Southeast Asia. And so there's tremendous market opportunity for companies to, to not only have supply chains there, but also to look at selling into those markets and doing great business. I know Quantum IR is one Utah company that we work with who's tuned in today uh, they've done tremendous work in Southeast Asia, growing very quickly, and that's been a very productive region for them to focus on over the past few years. So without further ado, let's jump into the topic at hand. Again, very grateful for Jonathan Bench and Dustin Daughtry to be with us today. I'll go ahead and provide a little bit of context on their backgrounds, and then I'll go ahead and kick it over to Dust uh, Dustin uh, to, uh, to start off today. So Jonathan Bench is the co-chair of Harris Brickens Corporate Practice Group. Uh, Jonathan is also a member of World Trade Center Utah. Jonathan focuses on international and domestic business transactions and is fluent in Mandarin and Cantonese Chinese. Jonathan earned a JD and MBA degree from the George Washington University in Washington, DC, and is a regular contributor to the China Law Blog. 
He also co-hosts Harris Brickens' weekly global law business podcast. And I'll just say that Jonathan has is, is, is become a, a close partner, a close friend. Um, if you're looking for expertise on China or Asia, uh, Jonathan is one of the smartest people in Utah that I've met yet. Um, definitely recommend reaching out to him. Uh, the law blog is phenomenal. The pod podcast is as, as well. So, Jonathan, we appreciate everything that you're doing to share your expertise with Utah companies. Thank Dustin, you so much. Glad to be here. Great to have you. Dustin Daughtry leads Dezen Shira and Associates Business Development in North America from their Salt Lake City office and is the point of contact for their clients and partners. Dustin has extensive experience in their major offices across the Asia region, including Beijing and Shanghai in China, as well as Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. And so clearly, uh, the fact that Dezen Shira has got their, their North America uh, business development director here in Salt Lake City speaks to how international Utah is, how important international markets uh, are for Utah companies. So Dustin, we're grateful to have you on and I'll go ahead and kick it over to you and you can take us from here. All right, thank you very much, Miles. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. Thanks to the WTC Utah for inviting me and for John to Jonathan for participating as well. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Um, Okay, great. So I'm going to jump right in uh, since we've gotten through the introductions. So if we think back uh, a few months to January and February, it seems like a really long time ago now, um, but it actually wasn't. So at that time, the main concern related to COVID was, was actually uh, China-based supply chains. And that was the original shock to global financial markets and the original cause of disruptions for companies across the globe and, and here in Utah. Um, so the shift to Southeast Asia from China for, for supply chains is not uh, anything new. It's been going on for several years, but uh, certainly uh, the challenges raised by the U.S.-China trade war and then COVID-19 um, accelerated that shift, let's say. So within Southeast Asia, there are uh, six major economies, we usually like to say, or the ASEAN six. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about Vietnam, Indonesia, and Thailand. Uh, but just taking a very a broad approach looking at Southeast Asia as a whole. I mean, what are some of the advantages, not just globally, but specifically vis-a-vis -vis China? Uh, low costs of doing business, low cost of manufacturing, low labor costs, labor availability as well. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, young dynamic populations that have a demographic dividend, for instance, in Indonesia or Vietnam and so on. But you also have rapidly growing domestic markets. Um, and for the U.S. specifically, probably a reduction of geopolitical risk as the U.S. is on good terms with, with basically all the countries in the region. Uh, you also have low trade barriers throughout the region. So for its level of development, I would say ASEAN, so that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, is extremely well integrated into the global economy and has been quite aggressive in establishing uh, free trade agreement, uh, you know, linkages with, with developed countries, developing countries internally, externally, and so on. So this confusing chart uh, shows the different overlaps of the uh, available uh, free trade agreements or economic cooperation uh, frameworks, essentially, for the region. And you'll see that Vietnam and Singapore specifically also have an FTA with the European Union, which is quite advantageous, but also benefit from the multilateral agreements that ASEAN has negotiated as a whole. Um, and this is just another representation of the same idea, looking at Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And these, these uh, slides, of course, will be shared, so you can go into more detail later on. Um, and then when just considering a new location, whether you are simply uh, looking for new sourcing partners, or you're looking at a, a larger investment, potentially a greenfield investment, or even setting up a trading company. Uh, so there are a number of factors that you obviously need to consider, such as the business environment, labor rates, uh, logistics costs, logistics linkages, infrastructure quality, taxation, uh, supplier quality, and so on. Uh, so these are just things to keep in mind as, as we look at each location. So now jumping into Vietnam. Uh, so Vietnam at a glance is seeing extremely um, high foreign direct investment, so that's FDI growth, and has a relatively strong labor force for the region. The population is almost 100 million, and it's a quite young population. Uh, so that's 
quite small when you compare it to, for instance, China, but everything is quite small compared to China. So it's a very significant player in its own right. Uh, and, and it's had six to seven percent GDP growth for a long time, uh, and it's projected to continue that for, for even longer. A few years ago, HSBC estimated that it could see six to seven percent growth up to the year 2050. So that's extremely steady and, you know, not off the charts like China was uh, 10, 15 years ago, but still quite impressive. Um, and looking at Vietnam versus China, so we consider, you know, the World Bank's ease of doing business ratings. I mean, you have to remember that Vietnam is still a poor country with, uh, you know, a nominal, nominal per capita GDP of probably about $2,500 or so per year. Um, so that's quite small. Uh, but for its level of development, I would say that its rank of 70 is decent and, and it's certainly been improving. Um, in, internally speaking, uh, you know, labor rates are extremely competitive. So we look at the minimum wage comparison between Vietnam and China. Uh, so China it, in reality is actually quite higher than $211 a month because it can vary based on provinces. This is just the lowest province. Uh, and there's other, you know, costs to consider as well, such as social welfare costs that employers are liable for, as well as corporate income taxation and so on. But on the whole, what we see is, uh, you know, a quite um, competitive uh, overall profile for doing business in the country. Land prices are reasonable for the region, as are office rents in the major economic uh, cities. Uh, so the hot industries for foreign direct investment are going to be manufacturing and technology. We're going to focus a little bit more on manufacturing. Uh, but, you know, Vietnam has been widely considered one of the quote unquote winners of the U.S. trade war. So even before COVID-19, you could argue it's also been a winner of COVID-19. And so far as anybody could be a winner, it's, it's had a very low infection rate because of a strong reaction uh, right at the beginning of the outbreak in China. But you know, Vietnam and Mexico are usually touted as the two winners of the U.S.-China trade war. So Vietnam has done quite well for itself in Asia and in manufacturing. Top sectors include electronics, textiles, garments, footwear, and so on, uh, furniture. But Vietnam is also trying to move up the value chain and not just be the low-end uh, manufacturing hotspot in Southeast Asia. So they are making significant investments in technology, such as automation and, and more you know, higher tech manufactured products to move up uh, the supply chain a bit. Um, and then on the IT side is not really the main focus of today, but it's also a very competitive location for IT services and IT outsourcing uh, because of the low wage rate, but relatively high uh, a skill level. Uh, the only weakness there I would say would be the general level of English, uh, although that is certainly uh, improving. Um, so. A really common complaint I get from U.S. companies who have maybe looked at sourcing from Vietnam in the past is the relatively high cost of certain goods. Most goods are going to be cheaper than China at this point, but, but some products still are not that competitive compared to China. And this, you know, this is caused by many factors, of course, but a, a big factor in this is what we call the localization rate. So Vietnam has a relatively low localization rate compared to China, and that means that Vietnam still needs to source input components from China. So Vietnam's supply chain for a lot of products is still somewhat dependent on China, which, of course, is a little bit of a problem if we're trying to uh, decouple ourselves from, from too much China exposure. However, the government is very aware of this uh, and has taken, uh, you know, demonstrable steps to improve the localization rate to, to target those few industries where it is still not as competitive as it should be. So it, it's seeking in the next 10 years to, to get its localization rate up near the level of China's. Um, so hopefully, you know, for those few products that are still not as competitive as they could be in Vietnam, that will be improving. The government is certainly very aware and, and responsive to these issues. And then if we just, in just as a sample industry, for instance, so I, I think it's not news to anybody that Vietnam's a big player in the garments industry, and that was one of the earliest uh, hot sectors for, for U.S. investment into Vietnam. I mean, if we look at the opportunities, even though the market is decently saturated already, we're still seeing very high growth uh, in, in output and investment that outstrips overall GDP growth. 
I mean, it's a major uh, employer uh, for the Vietnamese economy, and the quality is uh, dramatically improved over the last 10 years, for instance. So a lot of players that came in maybe in the 2000s or even 2010 and weren't so happy with, with the output uh, would be quite surprised today. I mean, some of the challenges for this industry, um, you know, would be subcontracting and a lot of the challenges that, that OEM producers are going to see everywhere in the world. Um, but, you know, it, it prevents provides a, an excellent opportunity and also a good test case for, for a lot of the successes Vietnam has had in manufacturing. Um, so we're going to look at a few different routes to market. Uh, and here we're going to consider the difference between whether you just want to source in, in a country or whether you're looking at doing a direct investment into the country. So if you're sourcing, you have several options to have some sort of legal interaction with suppliers in Vietnam, and you may or may not, you know, have a permanent establishment and eventually a legal entity. So the most, uh, you know, common one would just be, uh, you know, subcontracting or contract manufacturing, whereby you, you find a supplier in Vietnam to produce your product and, and you use a logistics partner or the supplier itself directly exports to the United States. Uh, so this is obviously the lowest, uh, you know, this requires the least investment or, or capital, uh, but it can be a bit harder to uh, exercise control over the supply chain. Uh, so if you were looking to set up some sort of legal presence in Vietnam to have boots on the ground, as it were, to have a local quality control person, you know, these roles could be outsourced without setting up an entity, but you could look at the RO option, which is a representative office, or you could set up a full uh, limited liability company, which takes the form of, of a trading company. So some considerations to keep in mind, you know, what's your level of commitment to the market? Is, is this something you're testing out? If so, you probably don't want to set up an entity. But if you're sourcing uh, a very high volume from Vietnam and quality and control over the, the supply chain itself as a concern, you can look at some options to uh, either set up an entity or hire people using an outsourced employment model. And then if you want to sell in the market, for instance, you can always do distribution from abroad through a local distribution partner, or you can outsource the manufacturing directly to Vietnam and, and have a partner you know, to, uh, sell in that market. Or you can go in the form of a partnership or of course form an entity uh, a common route to market for distributors in Vietnam would be a joint venture uh, because they want to, the company would want to take advantage of a local partner's, um, you know, existing network, distribution network and relationships. Like in China, relationships are extremely important in Vietnam and can take years to uh, cultivate. But that said, you know, the, the same level of due diligence uh, and, and, you know, self-protection that comes into place when you're looking at a, a joint venture or any sort of shareholder acquisition model in any other country also applies in Vietnam. And I think Jonathan's gonna go into more detail on this, but I, I have included uh, in just some details about different corporate structuring options in, in Vietnam and comparing them, the, the different models between one another. So you'll be able to, to view that at your leisure after the presentation. So now moving on to Indonesia. Uh, so Indonesia is the largest country population wise in Southeast Asia. Uh, so it has roughly 300 million people and a labor force of 135 million. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, an extremely populous country. Uh, and unlike Vietnam, for instance, whose success is dictated by the export processing model where the focus is really on manufacturing for export, uh, Indonesia is a bit more focused on the domestic market simply because of its size. Um, so it does soak in a large amount of foreign direct investment, again, just because of the size of the overall economy. Uh, but compared to, you know, on a per capita level, for instance, it's actually a bit of a laggard compared to Vietnam. This is because of a number of reasons, including a legacy of protectionism and, and restrictions on foreign investment in Indonesia. It has certainly improved in recent years, but you're going to find a foreign direct investment in, in Indonesia to be a lot more challenging than it would be in Vietnam, for instance, especially in uh, restricted industries. And there are, are unfortunately quite a lot of restricted industries. Uh, investment in Indonesia is also highly capital intensive, requiring a very high level of uh, paid up capital uh, for setting up an entity. Uh, so for that reason, 
we usually see partnerships being the most common form uh, of entry into Indonesia, um, but there are certainly exceptions to that. And, and it's clocked in a respectable, roughly 5% GDP growth for some time, and, and that looks to continue as well. Um, so comparing Indonesia and China, Indonesia ranks a little bit below Vietnam for ease of doing business. Uh, China, of course, ranks quite high in a lot of these measures. The minimum wage uh, in Indonesia is actually technically lower than Vietnam, but you have to remember that Indonesia is made up of 17,000 different islands uh, and extremely ethnically diverse. So there will be regions uh, administratively with a very low minimum wage. And that's because they don't have any industry because they're small islands with uh, poor linkages to, to the rest of the country. So the main manufacturing hotspots are the, the island of Java, part of the island of Sumatra, and then some of the islands in the channel between Singapore and the Indonesian main islands. Uh, so the minimum wage there is going to be a bit higher than Vietnam, actually, and a realistic manufacturing wage is going to be 10 to 15 percent above the minimum wage as well. Uh, so minimum wage numbers can be a little bit misleading, though it's a good base benchmark, I'd say. Uh, social welfare costs for the employer are quite low compared to Vietnam and China. Corporate income tax is decent at a flat 25 percent. Uh, land prices, however, are quite expensive, um, especially on the island of Java with the main industrial hotspots to the west and east of, of the capital, Jakarta. So that's definitely a, a downside and a consideration if you are looking to actually purchase land in the country. Um, so looking at hot industries for FDI, again, um, manufacturing is a priority of the government and they're looking to you know, uh, make it a larger proportion of, of the overall economic makeup of the country by 2030. Uh, that may or may not be reached, but they are certainly making an effort. Um, top sectors include textiles and garments, food and beverages, and then electronics. Um, we also see a lot of IT outsourcing in Indonesia as well, especially around Jakarta, and e-commerce is, is extremely important in Indonesia. Um, and makes up a large portion of the economy. You'd, if you visit Jakarta, you'd be amazed how much you can get delivered. That's partially because the traffic is uh, unbearable to go out, but um, it, it's, a, it's a very unique country. And like I mentioned, uh, the domestic market reigns supreme. So if you're interested in Indonesia, uh, usually it's the most popular uh, investment location if you're looking to actually sell a product in the country, which will require a partnership. Um, so just looking at the way information technology has, has transformed the Indonesian economy, and I touched on this a little bit, but uh, you know, e-commerce is a really big player and the government has gone out of its way to uh, incentivize that by opening up full foreign ownerships to some types uh, of you know, foreign e-commerce businesses and other IT businesses. Um, so you know, they are making an effort, but like I mentioned, uh, the negative list, so that's the list of restricted industries in Indonesia still remains quite high. And for this reason, a lot of investors, if they want to access the local market, will go through a joint venture. And then looking at the routes to market, if you're just sourcing in Indonesia, uh, it's, it's a bit more straightforward, um, <clears throat> but uh, you, know, you, you have the same contract manufacturing and subcontracting uh, options, but uh, if you want to actually establish a presence in the country, as I mentioned, uh, the capital requirements are quite high. You have several different entity models, which we can touch on in more detail later on, uh, but a partnership is usually going to be the, the most uh, popular um, you know, model for setting up an actual entity. You could go with a representative office, which is not a full entity, but would allow you to physically hire somebody in the country. Unfortunately, for a representative office, the administrative burden is relatively high for the region, uh, but at least you avoid the high capital requirements. And same thing with selling. Um, so selling, Basically, almost every industry in Indonesia, if you want to distribute a product in Indonesia, you need to go through a local distributor, which requires a partnership, which is unfortunate. Uh, but a lot of the same uh, structuring models will, will still apply as if you wanted to manufacture or, or source in the country. 
And here again, here's a, a little bit more detail on the different investment vehicles available to foreign investors. So when I mention the high capital requirements for Indonesia, I'm talking about usually between 150 to 200,000 US dollars to, to actually set up an entity, which is quite high for paid up capital. If you compare that to China, uh, it's extremely high. If you compare that to Vietnam, you're looking somewhere in the range of 20 to 50,000 US dollars usually. Uh, so it's quite a significant investment. And then finally, we're going to turn to Thailand. So we, we, I, we pick these three countries, not just because they're major economies in the region, but they're all quite distinct from each other. So Vietnam is sort of the prototypical export manufacturing powerhouse with very low wages and a strong manufacturing sector. Indonesia is a bit in the middle, a little bit more developed, but a much larger economy where the domestic market uh, plays a bigger role. Uh, and then Thailand is going to be the most developed of the three, right? Uh, so foreign companies have been doing business in Thailand for a long time. For certain industries such as automotives or electronics, you'll find quite sophisticated supply chains that are relatively high up the value ladder. Um, so it's a, a little bit of a different beast. Usually an investment in, or sourcing from Thailand isn't so much a labor cost play as it's a quality play, for instance. Um, but uh, last year we did see uh, unusually high uh, foreign direct investment growth in Thailand, which was uh, quite significant. The labor force is about 40 million people uh, and the GDP growth is about half that of Indonesia's as it is coming from a higher base level of growth, of course. So. Um, Overall, it's, it's quite a distinct economy from, from the other two. Uh, so you have a megapolis of, of sorts, a huge urban center in Bangkok, which, which dominates the economic activity of the country and has rings of suppliers and, and you know, industrial clusters around it. And then the rest of the country is actually much less developed uh, and would look a bit more like you know, a country like Vietnam or Indonesia, but uh, in Bangkok especially, you're dealing with a, a middle income country at this point, not so much a developing country. Uh, so ease of doing business, Thailand as a more developed country beats out Indonesia or uh, Vietnam. Um, unfortunately, uh, Thailand does have a high level of foreign direct investment restrictions, uh, but there's a major caveat to that, which benefits US investors, which I'll mention, but the actual ease of doing business, for instance, you know, dealing with contracts, getting your electricity turned on, getting construction permits is, is a lot easier than, than in Vietnam or uh, Indonesia. Minimum wage, uh, understandably, is a bit higher, uh, and you can expect to pay a, a lot over the minimum wage in the environs of Bangkok, for instance. But the social welfare cost to employers is quite low. The corporate income tax is competitive, equal to Vietnam's at 20%. Uh, and it has a pretty uh, straightforward goods and services tax. Um, if we look at hot industries for FDI, so, you know, Thailand is a much more developed and therefore diversified economy than, than for instance, Vietnam. So for manufacturing, it, as I mentioned, it is a major automotive hub for, um, you know, automotive component suppliers and producers. Uh, you, we've seen a lot of Japanese and intra-Asian investment into Thailand, but also EU and US firms as well. Uh, the government has gone all out in incentivizing the automotive industry, but we also have uh, you know, a large food and beverage sector. We have a large electronics sector. We have a large textile sector as well. Um, and for IT, I, I mean, it's a pretty well-known uh, IT outsourcing hotspot in the region. Um, but for fintech especially, uh, we see a lot of institutional support from the Bureau of uh, Foreign Investment, for instance, uh, and we see a lot of cutting edge, you know, digital payments and other fintech products in, in Thailand compared to the rest of Southeast Asia, with the exception of probably Singapore. Uh, so routes to market, essentially. Uh, so if you are sourcing or manufacturing, for instance, Again, you have the same subcontract and contract manufacturing options that doesn't require setting up an actual entity. But if you would like to set up an entity, Thailand gets a little tricky. Uh, so usually a company cannot be majority foreign owned in Thailand. There would be a cap of 49% on foreign investment and would re require a Thai 
uh, majority shareholder. Um, however, there's a big caveat, as I mentioned, there is a very old Treaty of Amity. You can tell by its name that it's quite old between the US and Thailand, which actually exempts uh, US companies in most industries from these foreign ownership caps. Uh, Thailand also operates something called an international trade center, which you can think of as the sort of special economic zone where the normal foreign investment restrictions don't apply. So that would be another way to get around uh, those foreign investment caps. But as U.S. investors in most industries, um, you know, there's really no need for a joint venture partner, which is quite nice. And then selling as well, distribution model working through a Thai partner will be the most popular by far, not just because of cost, but because of the foreign investment restrictions I mentioned. But again, the Treaty of Amity between the U.S. and Thailand does come into play. So it is possible for uh, U.S. companies to more easily set up a fully foreign-owned company in Thailand. Um, if you are in a restricted industry, for instance, and there are a few of those where uh, foreign, full foreign or majority foreign ownership is usually restricted, there is another way around that, which is called a foreign business license, which can be issued by the BOI. However, that can be quite a costly um, and time intensive process. So if your industry can fall under the Treaty of Amity and you um, do want to set up a, an actual entity in Thailand, we, we would highly recommend uh, taking advantage of those exclusions. And again, here's some more uh, detail for the differences between different structuring models uh, in, in Thailand. Um, so just wrapping up and looking at an assessment. So all three markets certainly present interesting opportunities for, for Utah businesses, whether through selling, sourcing, or, or direct investment opportunities. However, all the countries, as I mentioned, these three countries are, are quite distinct from each other. You can you view Vietnam as on one extreme, the least developed, highly uh, dependent on, on export processing and export manufacturing. Indonesia is in the middle, it's the largest, and the domestic market is king. Um, and then finally, you have Thailand, which is a lot higher up on, on the value chain, but a much smaller market than uh, population-wise than, than uh, Vietnam or Indonesia. Thailand also offers more high-tech specialization, and, and Indonesia falls somewhere in between. But Vietnam is certainly catching up. I don't mean to portray Vietnam as uh, completely undeveloped and, and not, um, you know, making use of technology and automation, because it is now, uh, and it's rapidly catching up. Um, so as supply chains shift southwards from China, you know, Southeast Asia as a whole can present uh, unique and, and potentially lucrative opportunities for, for Utah companies, but um, the region is not a monolith. I mean, it's, it's grouped together a lot because of political reasons and, and maybe a general lack of familiarity for, for Western audiences with the region, but each market is, is really distinct, has its own you know, not only unique culture, but unique laws that, that dictate the, the most common and sensible ways to do business. So it's important to, you know, do your full due diligence before looking at even doing something as small as sourcing from a country to, to understand all the considerations that go into it. And with that, uh, I'm going to be wrapping up and hand over to Jonathan. Thanks, Dustin. Looks like you have to unshare your screen so I can share mine. Okay, there you go. Okay, thanks. Okay. Trying to get, see my function F5. Ah, there we go. Okay. Welcome everyone. I know no one loves talking to the lawyer unless they have to, which is why we put me second. And uh, we gave Dustin, everyone likes to talk about the business opportunities and, and very much likes to avoid the legal risks. Uh, so I tend to be a necessary evil when my clients are, are looking to do business and, and I understand that. So I, I'll stay in my box and uh, happily fill you in on, on some uh, key legal issues to consider when you're looking at, at our three markets we're talking about today. So I think it, and I'm going to make sure I save enough time for Q&A because really Dustin and I are most interested in making sure that uh, we get your questions addressed. And if you have other questions, you can certainly reach us uh, you know, via email. We have our contact information at the end of our slides. 
and uh, and uh, I can speak for myself that certainly happy to well to do lunch whenever <laughs> whenever we can all do lunch again. Uh, but certainly happy to field calls and emails for for questions. So I think when you're looking at relocating uh, your, your your international operations, there are a lot of principles on the legal side that apply across uh, a lot of different markets. And so uh, you have to know where you are now, right? And by that, I mean, you have to know what your key contracts are in play, whether they're with your suppliers, your customers, your financiers, that could include your investors, uh, whether you uh, have a landlord you need to negotiate with, and what your insurance coverage is. And of course, all of you know, having lived through COVID-19 the past couple of months, how important the French phrase force majeure is. Uh, and so I threw that here because I want everyone to keep it in the back of our minds. In my lifetime, force majeure uh, has never come into play the way it has in the last two months. And so uh, when you're getting your contracts drafted, when you're reviewing your contracts, you will want to pay special attention to that because I think based on what we're all hearing, uh, this will not be the last international uh, crisis that we're all facing where someone's going to point to a force majeure clause and try to get out of the contract. And that may benefit you and it may hurt you. So it's just something to keep in mind. Now, if we're looking at uh, Southeast Asia, from a legal perspective, it is a, a patchwork of laws, right, of, of different legal systems. So you may be familiar with the, uh, you know, with our current legal system in the U.S., which is a common law system. Um, that's characteristic where we rely on precedent, where uh, adjudication is very adversarial. Um, but in, in the rest of the world, you, we mainly have civil law countries. And that's true in, in China, that's true in, in the rest of Southeast Asia. And then even in places like uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, then you have a mix of Sharia law, uh, where you'll see really interesting things like, uh, you know, when you're doing business, you can't, you can't do anything that would corrupt the morals and values of the country. Right. And so that's a very, you know, from an outsider's view, it feels very fuzzy because one, one person's morality is not the same as another, but it certainly is something to keep in mind. Uh, and so you're going to see a mix, right? Really, all of the countries that we're looking at today um, have some mix of common law, some mix of civil law, and, and then uh, particularly Malaysia and Indonesia have some Sharia law mixed in. So um, if someone hands you a contract, I mean, typically that's when I get involved, right? You've, uh, businesses, they, they start, you know, they get inquiries from abroad they start investigating and they bring me in because uh, they have a contract. Somebody, somebody wants to do something exciting with them, uh, you know, on the other side of the Pacific ocean. And, and they, and they want to know, is this contract good? Um, is it, you know, what should, what should be included? That's not there. Uh, what am I missing? Am I protected? What are my potential liabilities for messing this up? And often I get, I get that after, after a con, uh, company's already gone through one bad experience. Um, and so uh, the most important things you're looking at when you're contracting is uh, in the international side is you've got to look at your choice of law, uh, you know, whether it's a U.S. law that's applying or whether the target country law is applying, and then um, how you're going to resolve disputes. Um, we've had so much with the COVID-19, so many inquiries from people and companies who have sent, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to Chinese companies. And in exchange for that, they got junk and they got junk late or they got nothing at all and, uh, and they had no contract. And so they contact us in a panic and saying, can you help us get our, get our money back? And, and the sad reality is uh, that if you don't have a good contract with, a good, with the right choice of law provision and the right dispute resolution mechanism, then the answer is no, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do except try to negotiate and try to bring some, some soft power to play. So if we're looking at Vietnam, I, I like to start with a little bit of context. And I know that I'm trying to save time. So Miles, we may have to do a, a follow on presentation to, to dig more into the weeds in these countries, because uh, I've got, uh, you know, between entity formation, taxation, uh, employment and IP, I'm not gonna be able to cover all those in the next six minutes before we switch over to Q&A. Uh, so happy to do that. And certainly reach out to uh, Miles and Hannah and Jim at the World Trade Center if you're interested in another topic or a specific country, uh, because uh, Southeast Asia is big and I'm sure Dustin and I would love to come back and, uh, and talk more in depth uh, on whatever topics you wanna, you wanna hear. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through this quickly. Uh, I have one slide for each of the countries dealing with their, uh, their wading into international waters. And I think it's very interesting that between uh, you know, Vietnam, and Indonesia, which were both colonized by Europeans. You have Thailand sandwiched in the middle. That was never colonized by the Europeans. And so you see them, uh, that's why we have that Treaty of Amity and Economic Relations way back in 1966, 
which means that uh, Thailand was was not beholden to foreign powers and and was uh, you know didn't have to recover in the same way uh, and and really recover from civil wars the same way that Vietnam and, and Indonesia had to do. So if you're a history buff, uh, these are these always feed into why is the legal system of this country the way it is, and uh, I I really enjoy that aspect of it, but. Um, I want to give you a little more information on on uh, approaching your foreign investments from uh, foreign investments, foreign relationships from a, a legal perspective. And uh, I, I love this slide because uh, it, it's really uh, it seems uh, counterintuitive, but here's the here's the thing: uh, every country has a legal system, and that legal system is going to have characteristics that are familiar to you and unfamiliar. And so you can't assume that everything is totally the same or totally different. Totally different. Um, you really need to look at uh, what laws are on the books. How is the current enforcement uh, appetite? You know, are they really are they really enforcing those laws against foreign companies or not? And are they enforced evenly? Meaning that if you are a foreign company or if you are a, a partner, if you have a you know, Dustin was talking about Thailand. If you have a Thai partner that owns fifty one percent and you own 49 percent, then uh, are you going to be treated differently than if you owned 100%? And the answer is almost invariably yes. So if we're looking at general business climates across the, the three countries, uh, we have some very common things that, that, you'll be, uh, that you'll be able to focus on. So most of them in one way or another have limits on foreign ownership. They'll have limits on business sectors, they'll have limits on, on geography. Um, they'll have minimum investment requirements. They will probably have you needing to use a foreign partner, depending on the type of industry you're in. And several of them, at least two of them, have foreign currency restrictions. I think Indonesia is the only one that doesn't because they require all, all transactions to be done in Indonesia's currency. Um, and then you look at Vietnam and Indonesia, where you can't own real estate if you're a company. Uh, you just get long, long leases, you know, 50, 99 year leases. Um, and Thailand, which uh, doesn't have the same the same uh, history as Vietnam and Indonesia, where you can own land. Um, and then on the incentive side, you're going to see the same kind of thing, right? You'll see uh, the government policies are, you know, the government national plans and the policies are geared toward, uh, toward fostering uh, industries that the government wants to grow, you know, especially high tech enterprises, all of these, all of these countries, China included, they love IP. If you are a tech heavy company or you're bringing technology to the company, or to the country, then, uh, then they're going to love you. They're going to welcome you with open arms and they will help you find a way to do business in the country. Um, if you are benefiting uh, rural areas, uh, you know, areas especially like Thailand, Thailand's eastern portion of the country, that's, that's less developed, right? If you want to situate there, uh, then the government's going to help you do that. And of course, they're all going to have income taxing uh, incentives and duties. They're going to give you uh, discounts on your rent or your land use fees. And then uh, on the tax side, you're going to be able to, to take advantage of accelerated depreciation and, and loss carry forwards. So um, we really only have 15 minutes left. So I'm going to take a couple more minutes. I'm going to hit a couple of highlights and then we'll go to Q&A and uh, certainly happy to continue this in part two if, if we decide to do that. So. And Jonathan, uh, not to interrupt you, but just to, to underscore, you know, this is a very important topic. And so if people have to drop off right at 10, we understand you'll have a chance to get a link and they can, they can finish it. But if we okay. run to get past 10, I think that would be okay. Cause I, I, I want to make sure that we are mindful of time, but at the same time, this is an important topic. And so, and so I don't want to cut you too short. Perfect. Okay. And we can still do a follow up later on. And so we can dive okay. in. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks miles. So on the, uh, in all three of these economies, right, in Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, you uh, coming in as a, especially as a foreigner, right, you're, if you're a foreigner or your, your local talented folks that you want to be your director and officer positions, they're going to want to know, uh, you know, am I going to be protected from director and officer liability the same way I can if I'm working, operating in the U.S. as long as I'm adhering to my corporate responsibilities, you know, my, my director and officer duties. Uh, and the answer is yes, right there, as long as um, there, and I'm going to look at my notes for this because there's some very interesting, um, interesting uh, quirks, let's say, right, about local law. So in Vietnam, the, you know, all of, so all of these countries are going to have duties of loyalty, duty of care, and, and fiduciary duties for directors and officers. Um, but in Vietnam, they require honesty and maximum lawful interest of the company, right? So you always at all times have to be honest and act in the maximum lawful interest of the company. 
um, in Thailand, you, the directors and officers, can be criminally liable for the company's criminal activities. And that is a very scary thing for, uh, for directors and officers to think about, but it should hopefully keep people in line. And then in Indonesia, um, the directors and officers can be responsible for any fault, uh, any, any kind of loss to the company caused by their fault or negligence. And so negligence is a pretty, um, you know, it, it's a very fuzzy term, right? It's just kind of a, did you act with general business judgment uh, appropriate to, you know, the time and circumstances and the information you had. And that's basically the standard we have in the U.S. Um, and so it's, it's not necessarily that scary, but it is, uh, you know, have, like I said, having these laws on the books, you're always in the back of your mind wondering, well, how evenly are these enforced in country? Um, so each of, each of the countries, you're going to see a corporate veil. So that a parent company, international or otherwise, is not going to have liability for the, um, for the parent or for the, the child entities, right? For all of the subsidiaries. Um, you're going to see contractual arrangements, and, and Dustin described this, right? Uh, a lot of times we talk about that as a, as a light strategy to go into one of these economies where you, you have something you need to do, you're not really ready to drop 10, 20, $100,000 on, on a venture, but you, you want to get something done. And so finding the right partner in country and setting up the right contractual arrangement is, is certainly permitted. And I would say is a very normal way of doing business in Asia, including China. Um, and then the, these all permit uh, non-cash contributions for equity. And this is important because you're gonna have talented people in country. If you're setting up some kind of green fields or other uh, investment company, you are gonna to want to be able to uh, reward your talented folks with some, with some equity. And so they don't necessarily have to provide a cash contribution in order to, uh, in order to get options or, uh, or other kind of creative equity in the company. Um, so Vietnam uh, has, has its own type of business vehicles between uh, multi-member LLCs where you have to have uh, you know, less than 50 or you have a shareholding company that has a minimum of two. So you can think of those as LLCs and corporations. Um, there's some interesting positions. Uh, you have to have a legal representative, which is normal, but you also have to have a chief accountant. Uh, you need a, a board of members and uh, to be along with management and you need an inspection committee. And the inspection committee uh, is, is very fascinating because they're, uh, it's an independent group uh, that cannot be related to any of the, any of the primary shareholders. So the idea is that the inspection committee is there. It's kind of like an internal audit committee. And so you see Vietnam very focused on the financial aspects of the company uh, through the chief accountant and, and the inspection committee. Uh, looking at Thailand, the most common business vehicle is a, is a private limited company. As, as Dustin said, if you are, uh, you know, depending on the industry, you may not even be able to form your own company. You may, you may be a, a minority owner in an existing company, or if you form a new company, you're going to need a majority Thai partner uh, to be with you on that venture. Um, the nice thing is that Thai, uh, Thailand is very, uh, I'd say out of the three, they're currently the easiest to do business with. Um, in, Indonesia is making some, uh, some big strides in their, uh, I think they have six omnibus bills that are proposed right now that are going to revamp the whole way the business is done in the country. And, uh, and Vietnam is certainly trying to catch up and modernize, uh, as Dustin was saying. So um, I'm, I'm going to skip past this. There's some, uh, I think that the, having a, a Thai quota of directors on your board of directors is, is an important uh, thing to keep in mind. And you'd see that in, in Indonesia as well. Also, that last bullet point said that uh, that your existing shareholders are going to have a right of first refusal if you're offering new shares, and so that uh, that's the kind of thing we like to contract around in in the U.S. And so you'll see quirks like that where you know if some you're bringing on a new investor or you're you're offering new equity, and all of a sudden uh, you know the minority shareholders are clamoring for a piece of that, and and they don't have you don't have to abide by that in the U.S. depending on how you've written your agreements. And so um, I think you know in all of these economies the uh, the rule of the game is you got to know what rules you're playing by and uh, you just have to expect that it's not going to be quite the same as you're used to in, in dealing just with the U.S. Um, so in Indonesia, the uh, LLCs are, are by far the most common entity used right now, um, but there are a lot of what I consider a lot of burdensome requirements, right? I mean, as a business lawyer, I, I like my clients to have the flexibility to do what they want to do. And in Indonesia, you have, um, you know, you have this regular report on your capital investment activity. You have to submit audited financial statements every year. Uh, you have a mandatory manpower report on your, on your employees. Um, the minimum investment value is 
through the roof compared to what you can you can form a, a company in Utah for you know, 20 bucks, right? I mean, plus your filing fee, there's nothing you have to do. So, um, you know, having to put in this minimum investment value uh, and, and the paid in capital is less than that. I think it's uh, 25% of the 673K. So uh, it does seem burdensome, but, uh, you know, Indonesia is the next big China. So I think that you just need to expect that, that you're going to have to jump through a lot of hoops if you want access to that market both from a domestic consumption side, but also from tapping the labor pool. Um, and then you're gonna see foreign national limitations on certain positions. And so uh, Indonesia is, uh, I would say, is, uh, is a lot like China when I'm comparing them in my mind, um, including things like you have to have, a, you know, your maximum debt equity ratio is four to one. So you will see, uh, I would say Indonesia is gonna throw you the most curves. Um, so when we're looking at um, switching, switching to taxation, uh, each of these, each of these economies is going to have a, uh, you know, in one form or another, all of these points. Okay, so there will be a tax residency requirement uh, or a criteria for your foreign nationals who are there. Especially, this is especially important to them, and also for what we would call in the U.S. your minimum contacts with uh, with the country. So, depending on how much business you do uh, and and really what kind of business entity you form, uh, you will have you and your uh, your foreign nationals who are there as managers and uh, and your local folks will all have this tax residency requirement. Um, so of course we have we have income tax on the entity side and on the individual side. You're going to see uh, a range of, of VAT and sales taxes. You'll see stamp duties, uh, real estate taxes, and uh, taxes on your business license. And then of course, especially in um, in Vietnam and Indonesia, you're going to see pretty hefty social insurance and health insurance requirements. Uh, and that's that's uh, you know historically th this is where the the history piece comes in right where the the Vietnam uh, Vietnam Revolution Civil War and the same thing that happened in Indonesia those all came out of uh, similar to China uh, post colonial rule where where uh, you have infighting and you have uh, leaders who rise up and they represent the people right and so you're going to see a lot of uh, protections on the labor side in Vietnam and in Indonesia because. Uh, because the governments were conceived to benefit the people, uh, you know, in a really in a socialist form, less so a U.S. where we have more uh, free free market capitalism, but uh, very much detailed uh, or aimed toward protecting the people. And you'll see that as we move on to uh, to employment matters. So um, employment is uh, is a really interesting and sticky area, and I actually don't consider myself an employment lawyer. But I'm a corporate generalist, and I, I like to be able to be conversant in all the aspects so I can help my clients issue spot, right, if finding out what is potentially going to be a risk. And employment is always, always a risk. So make sure that when you are, uh, I mean, for instance, this, this is not uh, any of the countries we're talking about, but for instance, in China, there's no such thing as an independent contractor, right? It doesn't exist. And in the U.S., we have those. And so a lot of people think that uh, you go into a country and, oh, they're not our employees. They're just independent contractors. And, uh, and I, my eyes, I always blink and I, and I hold my breath and, and I think, well, uh, you know, we need to check out the laws and see if you can, if you really have an independent contractor, if you can have an independent contractor. And then, um, you know, especially in, in Vietnam and Indonesia, uh, you know, you, you have to be very careful. So, um, I think some of the important parts uh, in Vietnam, you you have to have a written labor contract unless the uh, unless the term of employment is is three months or less. And actually, next year it's going to change to one month or less. So basically, Vietnam have to have a written employment contract. It's going it has to cover all kinds of things like your um, you know your rest breaks, your holidays, your PPE, your training and skills improvement. Um, and then all the statutory benefits as well. And, and even if you don't include those in the contract, they're still going to be included. Um, that's what happens in a, uh, in a country like Vietnam, where, uh, where it's a civil law country, civil law jurisdiction. And so you have all these extras included that are in the civil code. And so I would say generally, when you, when you get a contract from a civil law country, it, it'll be a lot shorter than you're used to in the U.S. You know, when I draft contracts for an M&A transaction, you know, those are going to be 40, 50 pages. Whereas we do, uh, if we do an, uh, for doing a business transaction with with a civil law country, it could be five or six pages, and that would be a, an, an acceptable contract length for that because there's so many other provisions that are already included in the civil code. Um, Vietnam, you're going to see a big collective labor issues, right? I mean, there are 
as I was as I was uh, preparing for this and reminding myself, uh, between Indonesia and Vietnam, there are there are very serious labor labor issues to be considered, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something to understand as you're going in. Right? I mean, all of these things, uh, this legal legal counsel that I'm providing, uh, not as attorney client privilege, of course, uh, or attorney client relationship. All of this is uh, is to help you as business owners figure out how to make the best business decision. Right? It's all within the context of of here are the guidelines. Now let's try and make sure that this deal can work um, in a way that, that everyone can live with. And so um, I would say that even, you know, if you're, if collect the idea of collective labor kind of scares you away, I would say, don't, don't worry about it. It's just something that you need to know um, is there, right? I mean, there are, Vietnam has trade unions that you'll have to deal with. Um, you have to have a collective labor agreement with your employees. And so you're going to see, um, you know, and even such things like there's no at-will termination for your employees in Vietnam, right? You have to go through the, um, you have to go through a process with the union, the local union, either the union within your company or the union uh, that your company members are part of. Um, now, looking at Thailand, um, the labor laws are still going to apply to uh, your foreign nationals who are working there, just like in Vietnam. Uh, there's no requirement that the contracts in Thailand be in writing, though, um, and really less than 5% of Thai workers belong to unions. And actually, the U.S., uh, took beef uh, end of last year with Thailand's poor worker protection um, and just last month suspended Thailand's GSP privileges, um, which is basically a, uh, it's kind of a, a shortcut to, to let Thai goods come through uh, with significant duty, uh, you know, minimizing the duty that would otherwise apply. And because um, U.S. trade representative looked at, at Thailand and says, you know, you've got laws on the books, but your, your workers, your migrant workers are not protected well enough in, in reality, right? As I talked earlier about how laws are actually enforced. Um, and so the U.S. thought it was important enough to, uh, to remove this special privilege from Thailand for a time as, as we try to put pressure on Thailand uh, to improve its, its, work, its workforce protections. Um, I'd say in all these markets that consequences of, of wrongful termination of an employee are, are quite severe, more so in Indonesia and in, in Vietnam, uh, but also in Thailand as well. And so your, the safest way to nav navigate these situations is to negotiate a severance agreement with your, uh, you know, with your employees. So, of course, you don't want to think early on in the relationship about how to prepare to cut off the relationship, but that's really, uh, that's really everything that... Uh, that, that's my world, right, is preparing for the worst and, and hoping for the best. Um, Indonesia is, a, is an interesting market because all of the Indonesian, all the contracts have to be in Indonesian. Um, and they have, uh, if you don't have a, uh, a contract in place, uh, then uh, if you don't have a written contract in place, then the employee is deemed to be a permanent employee. And that sounds scary. It sounds as scary as it is, really. Um, and so it's better to have uh, a written contract that, that really details the, the terms of engagement. Um, Indonesia, you're also going to see labor unions and collective bargaining uh, and also permit uh, collective labor actions by employees. Um, and there's also no unilateral termination by the employer, right? You have to go through, uh, you know, you suspend them and then you go through the process of, of, uh, of uh, going through the severance with the employee ending in a mutual termination agreement. Now, moving on to IP. This is, I uh, could certainly spend a, a whole hour comparing the different IP uh, availability and protection. You're going to see, uh, the nice thing is that all of these countries are modernizing. They, uh, some of them are, are involved more than others on the international stage. And so when you need to protect your IP, which is really what you need to do before you even think about stepping foot in the country, uh, you need to make sure that if you are taking anything with a business card on it, if you are really, even if you're, you're emailing into the country, uh, you want to make sure that you know what the IP laws are in the country, and especially in that regard to protect your trademarks. And then, of course, before you start showing anyone your designs for any of your products, uh, you want to understand where the country is with respect to patent protection and whether they, the country is a first to file or a first to use country. Uh, it, you don't want to take a design in and have it, have it stolen before you even have a chance to really get into the negotiation phase with your supplier. Um, so in, uh, and all of these, all these countries, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia are all first to file countries, which means that you, um, you know, even if you're in country producing it, your manufacturer's producing it, it's not protected in the way it is if you actually are, uh, if you've actually taken the time to file it. Um, 
the trademarks are always the, it's the most interesting conversation I have with clients because um, a lot of people don't know that once you start using any kind of, any kind of distinctive mark, right? Any phrase, any, uh, any logo that your IP rights start to accrue, right? You, you really start to have IP rights. And so they, um, you still need to file to protect those rights, um, but your rights, rights happen as soon as you start using them. So you need to pay attention to, um, you know, to who basically who is, who is throwing your brand and your trade names around on the international stage so you can make sure you keep pace with that. Um, I'm going to hit on each of these countries really quickly in terms of um, the best, the, the best, uh, the best parts of their IP protection. Um, all of, like I said, all of the countries have, have patents, right? For varying term lengths, you know, um, 20 years seems to be the standard, um, unless it's a utility patent, in which case that's 10 years, all of them will let you register online. Um, and, uh, and, and really all of them have pretty great enforcement mechanisms on the books for your IP, for any, any IP that gets infringed. And even to the tune that uh, I think Thailand and I can't remember which other, um, let's see it here in my notes, but, uh, some of them have criminal sanctions, right? You can, you can file basically a civil suit and have a parallel criminal suit going at the same time. And that really deters people from wanting to infringe your IP, right? If, if you understand that and you, and you have that in your, in your contracts, right? When you're leading with your, your letter of intent or your term sheet or your, uh, your confidentiality agreement, if you show that you understand that in their country that there are criminal sanctions for violating, uh, you know, for taking your IP and doing whatever they want with it, that can be a very powerful deterrent and, uh, and it, it lets your, your partner in country know that you have good legal advice and that you certainly know and are prepared to enforce your rights if you need to. And I don't, I don't like to carry the big stick around, but I like to remind my clients that you have a big stick and you should flash it once in a while, just so people know um, you have the option to do that. Um, so we'll, we see this, this good protection in, uh, on copyrights as well. Um, and you know that, uh, you probably know that trade secrets are, are something that's, it's a very kind of fuzzy nebulous topic. And you know, all states in the US have trade secret protection. Most international countries do as well, because um, these countries understand that in order to foster innovation, they have to uh, protect the, the early ideas and, and the, uh, you know, the things that aren't necessarily patentable and things that wouldn't be a trademark, but that are just very good processes. Um, and so you need to protect that information as well. Um, I think that uh, in terms of practical advice, yeah, I, I like giving this really in all my presentations because um, it's just good business practice. And uh, since you're talking to a lawyer, I should be able to, to help, you, help you out without, without charging you once in a while, right? So I think the um, important thing to think about when you're, when you're going to international relationship, you need to start with what we call an NNN agreement. You know, that's a non-disclosure, non-competition, and, uh, and confidentiality. I can't remember what the other end is off the top of my head. Um, but the idea is that when you are going into a relationship, the other side understands that uh, the discussion itself is confidential. They can't take your intellectual property and they can't go around you to work with your, you know, to work with your, your downline folks. So um, you need to lead with, with an NNN agreement and term sheets so you have the right parts of the conversation at the right time, right? You need to lead out with those things. Next is that your relationships are, are the most important thing you have. And if you don't keep those relationships strong, such as by sending someone uh, like from Dustin's company over to check out your manufacturing operations, then you are, um, you're really harming yourself. And we've seen this in China, especially now where, where the companies that have strong relationships uh, with their suppliers, uh, they can usually get through the difficulties. And so you need to plan, you know, keep your relationship strong, but also plan that uh, you know, that at some point you're going to have to fight and make sure that your contracts are protecting you in that regard. Um, I think in global outlook, uh, the trade war is not going away. Uh, so I think that uh, the overflow to Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia is, is going to continue to rise. Um, everything I'm reading, everything I'm seeing from our government and Chinese government says that we're continuing to decouple. And so uh, if you have a reason to stay in China, by all means, stay in China. If you have a reason to get out, you need to, you need to start doing that. Um, we're going to see a lot of protection of our, of our core industries. And I think especially in pharmaceuticals, uh, if you are a pharmaceutical supplier or you're in, uh, you know, even the natural products world where you're sourcing products um, that uh, may be seen as, as something pharmaceutical grade, 
that uh, China is not going to be the center anymore. We're going to be looking at countries like India um, and Vietnam and other places where we don't have the geopolitical issues like we do with China. Um, uh, and so then looking ahead at each of these, each of these three countries, just something to, to keep in mind, uh, you know, looking forward. Uh, Vietnam is doing a great job of reducing its overall administrative burdens. Um, it's modernizing. It's, the legal system is trending more toward the Western, uh, how we have a legal system in the West. And so it will, I think it will continue to be a good, reliable partner to do business with. Um, and Vietnam certainly optimistic, right? Where other countries are looking at, at negative growth or, or, or significantly reduced growth. Um, Vietnam's prime minister just said on May 6th that he expects Vietnam's GDP to grow at 5% this year. Uh, and so, uh, you know, based on how they've grappled with COVID and what they're seeing as overflow from China, um, you know, part of that may be puffery a bit, but um, I think Vietnam is certainly on the right track to continue to grow. Um, Thailand continues to be welcoming to foreign investment. You know, they've got good promotions, uh, good deregulation, trade liberalization, um, continues to be R&D and innovation focused. Uh, and then there's some great uh, infrastructure projects that are underway. There's a high-speed railway project linking three major airports. And then there's a double track rail lines project that's connecting the industrial zones to the rest of the country. So. Um, you're going to see good opportunities to move goods around the country in Thailand uh, better than in the past. And then, as I mentioned before, Indonesia um, has six omnibus bills right now that are proposed. Um, one of them is on job creation, which is going to offer more certainty and flexibility to businesses. And then the other is, is a tax omnibus bill that's going to lower the tax rate from 25% to 20%. So if those pass, certainly keep, uh, you know, keep an eye on those. Um, Indonesia is going to change in a big way, I'd say, in the next five to 10 years and, and be much more business friendly, um, you know, all, all still within the backdrop of, of it being a relatively complex market because of the geography spread. So that, I believe, is, uh, is all I've got. So I will, I'm going to kick it over to Hannah, I believe, for our Q&A. Hannah? Yes, thank you so much. Um... For all of this information, it's been super great. We just have a few questions that have been submitted. Um, one of them is from Louis Chung, and he's asking, does the minimum wage include the social welfare? Uh, the minimum wage rates listed do not include social welfare, but the social welfare rates are likewise listed in that same table. So you, there are a few exceptions which make it complicated because there are different components that go into social welfare. Um, and some of those are capped based on nominal salary, but in general, you need to consider adding uh, that percentage on top of the minimum wage as the overall, not even the overall, but the employer burden uh, of the labor cost. Great, thanks. Um, Sharon asked, with businesses moving out of China, how does this change Hong Kong's reputation as the gateway to China? Um, does this impact the competition between Singapore and Hong Kong, considering both are pretty high up on the World Bank's ease of doing business index? Jonathan, do you mm -hmm. want to go? Or I'm happy to take I, that. So I, I lived in Hong Kong for a couple of years, and, and I keep close pace with what's going on. And I think that based on the way China has been just, I mean, everything aside, the way that China continues to hammer Hong Kong's, uh, what, what should be, uh, you know, one country, two systems policy for the next, really the next 27 years. Um, it's Hong Kong is, it, it's very sad to see what's happening. So I think that even, um, you know, even without the trade war, um, without, you know, with, with the US trying to pull back from China and, and really forcing other countries to do the same, that uh, that Hong Kong is going to suffer, and I'm, my heart goes out. I, um, so I think, yeah, Singapore Singapore is going to continue to be a, a winner against that. I think that Taiwan um, will, to some extent, as well, and certainly these Southeast Asian countries. Um, I mean, you, Hong Kong, you're really talking about financial, right? I mean, we haven't Hong Kong hasn't doesn't do a lot of serious manufacturing that was pulled over across the border to the Guangzhou area years ago, and so um, Hong Kong really is a financial center as a way to uh, as a springboard into China. All those, all those important things have really uh, waned quite a bit in the last, last couple of decades. So I think we're going to see um, Hong Kong continue to dim. I don't see the CCP in China letting up at all on that. Um, and I think that uh, it's going to be, we're going to have to watch, but certainly um, you always need to have your contingency plan when you're, when you're engaging with, with Southeast Asia. Things, things can change overnight. Uh, just, to, just to add on on that, um, I did a presentation comparing 
the futures of Singapore and Hong Kong uh, right before COVID hit the U.S. strongly. Um, and I would I would second all of that and, and just sort of express, unfortunately, extreme pessimism for the future of Hong Kong. Um, and really, except for physical location, I don't think it has any competitive advantage over Singapore at this point. Um, it used to, certainly, uh, but has China has deepened its linkages with Singapore? Uh, a lot of the things that people used to use Hong Kong for as a gateway, um, it doesn't do them better than Singapore does. And Singapore provides a lot better linkages with the rest of Southeast Asia. So uh, I, I would strongly encourage someone to look at Singapore as an alternative. Great. Um, just really quickly, can you compare IP protection in Southeast Asia versus China? Sure. Um, so you will see in China, um, China's really improved his IP protections, right? I mean, the, the tough thing, so I would say just on a straight, you know, reading the, the black letter law on the books uh, that uh, they're on par, right? That, that these, uh, you know, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, they understand uh, that strong IP protection is the key to enticing businesses to come and, and bring their, their talented folks and their, and their good ideas to the country. Um, the difference in China is that Chinese government, and this is very well documented uh, at the federal government level in the US, uh, China has for 20, 30 years now had a very strong um, and now open policy of, of strong arming IP out of, out of country, out of companies' hands, right? So uh, forced IP transfer, if you wanna do business with, uh, you know, with, in this industry, with this, with this company, you have to turn over your IP um, and you have to disclose, disclose, disclose. China's got a new, um, uh, what's the name of it? It's a new um, technology law. I can't remember the name of it now. Um, but under the guise of public security, which is what China loves to use, you're going to see uh, the back doors put into all the servers in China. So if you have any data in China, it's going to be um, you know it's going to be subject to government review. You have to you have to decide uh, you have to classify your data on a scale of one to four on how potentially sensitive it is to China's national security. And that's going to be verified by by the government. And so basically, if you're keeping data in China, there's a very good chance that any state owned uh, company, including your competitors, will have access to your data. Um, and China is not, um, you know, China says, well, it's all lies, 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 but that's the laws on the books. And uh, you need to look at how the laws is going to be enforced. And so I, in some regard, I'm extremely pessimistic about about China, if you're bringing large amounts of sensitive data into the country um, that that uh, deal with your commercial success, because your, your, your servers are going to be openly read by the Chinese government. Great. Um, does the Amity Treaty between U.S. and Thailand cover U.S. companies as a direct owner or does it cover U.S. as a beneficial owner? I believe it's beneficial owner, but I would have to double check that. Okay. Um, and the last question, are there any restrictions on removing capital from these countries? How easy is it to jump ship if investments don't pan out? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I could start on that. Dustin, certainly feel free to, to jump in. I would say that um, they all, uh, you know, they're gonna have different than China, okay? So I'm comparing China to these countries, right? China has a lot of foreign currency restrictions and these, uh, you know, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand do as well, but um, but not in the same way that China does. So if you, if you need to pull up, um, you know, certainly I think the hardest thing is going to be to decide how to get rid of your employees. If you're getting rid of employees, that will probably take the longest. Um, you're certainly going to have to pay taxes. And that's really what on the law, the books on the law, uh, laws on the books, sorry, that's what, uh, that's what I'm seeing is uh, they're concerned with making sure you pay taxes, right? Making sure that you correctly report and pay your taxes. Um, but certainly no, no blanket restrictions on, on pulling your, your currency out of the market. Uh, and bringing it back home, you're repatriating those as long as, as you have, uh, as you're paying taxes. And, and all of these countries have double taxation treaties with the U.S. And so you will not have to worry about paying, uh, paying taxation twice on those profits as you're bringing them home. Um, right. So uh, corporate profit, right? If you want to remit dividends, as Jonathan said correctly, as long as you're in compliance with your taxes, that's fine. Getting out your registered capital, uh, if you want to dissolve your company, is a lot more complex and time consuming. Uh, but it is possible in all three of these countries. I'm most familiar with Vietnam. 
Um, so in Vietnam, the only exception to that would be, for instance, if you have legal proceedings against you or if you've entered into bankruptcy protection, uh, then you have to really fight to, to get any of your registered capital out. But um, it is theoretically possible. Uh, if you want to dissolve your company, you have to make sure all taxes are properly paid. Uh, but I would expect uh, a several month processing period to to actually get your capital out at least. Okay, thanks. Jim, I'll hand it over to you to wrap things up. Thanks, Hannah. There we go. Uh, what an incredible presentation. I mean, uh, great presenters with in-depth information that you can utilize. I hope everyone can take away uh, the great opportunity that exists in Southeast Asia. Um, and, uh, and also the, the, the need to do your due diligence as you look at uh, opportunities for supply or trade uh, in that area of the world. Uh, clearly a fantastic place to do business and, and clearly a place where you need to be wary of uh, the, how doing business there is different than in the US and how you can prepare yourself uh, to be the most profitable and to, to mitigate your risks. Uh, so there, you know, we have a lot of people who've soldiered on and, and, uh, and seen us all the way through to the end. Uh, I just want to make a quick pitch to you, uh, to you all about World Trade Center Utah. You know, some of you uh, have the sophistication, the relationships where you know exactly what questions you want to be asking to Dustin and Jonathan. Um, I believe their uh, contact information will be available for you. Uh, if you want to, to call and follow up and, and get some work done. For those of you who are who um, felt that this presentation was a bit of a fire hose or wondering what are my next steps or how do I even approach this, um, I'm happy to talk to you here at World Trade Center Utah uh, where we're adding additional capacity to help companies with their supply chain management, including supplier identification, technical import assistance, things like how to use a foreign trade zone to your benefit to, uh, to better manage cash uh, along your supply chain. But also, of course, through our market expansion offerings, uh, which many of you uh, probably know about from our market research to our step grants, which companies can use for uh, international business development. Uh, those are uh, uh, a reimbursement grant that you don't have to pay back. Uh, pretty fantastic program we offer here. And you might also know a bit more about our, our trade missions or our trade shows. You might have come with us uh, on one of those. We're hosting a virtual trade mission to India. You can watch for an invitation for uh, that to come into your inboxes sometime soon. Uh, these virtual trade missions are a great uh, low, uh, um, low risk, low cost, uh, high potential way to, to make uh, introductions and inroads into uh, another Asian market uh, that uh, holds a lot of promise. So please uh, come and reach out to us. You can reach out to Hannah or myself. Uh, we'd be happy to answer your questions and uh, to help you plug into our services. You know, nothing that we do uh, we could do without our partners. So let me end by thanking again, Dustin and Jonathan for being on, uh, for helping us to, uh, to provide this information to you, for being the content experts uh, and, uh, and, uh, and for being members of, of World Trade Center Utah. Really grateful uh, for all the, the good work that they do. So with that, I think I'll, uh, we'll close the webinar and we'll let you get back to your day-to-day. -day. Uh, I look forward to follow-ups with all of you. Take care.